This is the Soulfully Casual Podcast hosted by Matty Ice. And now, your host, Matty Ice. Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Soulfully Casual Podcast hosted by Matty Ice, which is me. Uh, this is the 50th episode, and while many of you might not think that that's a huge accomplishment because there are tons of podcasts out there with, I'm sure, tons of episodes, um, this was a passion project of mine, something that I didn't ever think that I would start. So the idea of 50 feels significant, um, and I just want to first say thank you to everybody who has listened, everybody who's clicked, subscribed. Um, it means a lot because it just means that things keep going up and I get to keep doing this, which makes me extremely happy outside of the other things that also make me happy. Um, in the next couple of episodes, I'll have some announcements to make. We have taken on some uh, corporate affiliates, so some big things happening. But I wanted to do something special for 50 uh, because it felt significant. And I could think of nothing better than having a guest, an actual interview uh, on the show. I've had Mike on. He's been sort of just, you know, uh, talking with me through through some Marvel stuff. We've been having a good time, but to me, I wanted to do something special and have an actual guest who you all could get to know, who I know, because I think that this person is interesting. And I could think of no better person than probably the Soulfully Casual super fan, and that is Miss Joyce. So Miss Joyce, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for making it to come on the show, and I want to welcome you. So um, how are you today? I am well, Matt. Thank you for having me on. Um, I feel honored. Well, um, you know, that's that's debatable, but uh, as far as how much of an honor it is, but it's definitely an honor for me to to have a guest and again, have somebody who, um, you know, feels like they have have supported me uh, in many ways, uh, in many motherly ways, too. And that that has not gone unnoticed. But uh, obviously, I know who you are. Uh, my audience does not. So I wanted to give you a little bit of time to tell them a little bit about yourself. And then, um, you know, we'll just kind of start talking and see what goes. Sounds great. My name is Joyce. I am from Southeast Pennsylvania. I grew up in King of Prussia, home of the Baby Mall for a long time, and lived in Westchester for over 30 years. With a stop in Baton Rouge for two and a half years, I now reside in Northern Virginia. Um, so I'm actually not too familiar with the state of Pennsylvania in general. Like, I've, obviously, I've been there. Um, I've never lived there, and I've, I've sort of jaunted through there. Um, what about the state of Pennsylvania? Like, were you originally from there? Is it somewhere you ended up? Uh, because you obviously spent a significant amount of your life in the state of Pennsylvania. I will correct you to the extent that it's the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Oh, right, that's true, because we are in the that's Commonwealth of Virginia, too. Absolutely. Um, my parents were both from Philadelphia. Okay. In a small quirk of fate, I actually was born in Louisiana. I do believe the same hospital as your lovely wife was born. In a that is correct. State. Yes. And then my parent, after my dad was done in the Air Force, my parents moved back to the Philadelphia area. And my father was an en engineer, a general electric, like so many others. And I grew up okay. in King of Prussia, which was just a sleepy little town. I've heard, I've heard of this King of Prussia. It, uh, it almost is like, a, has a cult following with the people that I know who are sort of in and around that area, but I've never been. Uh, and I've heard about this, this mall. Yes, I mean, we were the original mall, mall rats of the 70s. Um, it was a little town that when I went away, when I went to college, people would say, where are you from? And I'd say, King of Prussia, and they'd say, King of who? Um, it was a very safe little town, very good, excellent school district, um, isolated to an extent that there really wasn't a lot of transportation in and out. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I, I don't know if isolated is the correct word, um, mainly with people. I don't know. Isolated is not the correct word. The, it was. It's always been there since pre-colonial days. It had the. It's right next to Valley Forge Park, so it's always been there. And it was in the 50s and 60s when General Electric started the space program, mm -hmm. when people such as my parents moved there from Philadelphia to work on the missile defense system. Oh, so that's how a lot of people got there. I mean, it's so it's it kind of sounds like uh, one of those towns where there's like a centralized place that a lot of people are employed. So like my my wife's family's from Charleston and in and around there, they have the paper mill down there. And a lot of people, either their parents, grandparents or what have you, have been employed there. And it's almost like a rite of passage for people that sort of stay in town. Um, and of course, 
a whole bunch of Chrissy's uh, family has worked there. So it kind of sounds like that. But um, what is what was your favorite thing about uh, living in Pennsylvania? I it was a wonderful place to grow up and it was a wonderful place to raise my children. It was I spent the last 30 years that I was there in Westchester and it just was the kind of place that you could be young in and old in and everybody was just it was just a very comfortable place to live that it met all it had everything that you needed or yeah. I should say that I needed um I just really liked it it's interesting that you say you know being able to be old and being able to be young there um you know I've never really lived in a, a place that's been like that because I mean I guess the, the town that I grew up Bristol Rhode Island is kind of like that but mm -hmm. there's a lot of younger people like it's not a lot of retirees and where my parents live now which is in uh southeast mass it's a very old town dartmouth is an old town there's a lot of you know older people there and so i lived there and you can't be young there um mm -hmm. you can be old there but like being young there was tough because i was one of the only young people who lived there um but i found where i grew up to be somewhat limiting you know once i got past high school and i, I kind of moved out um you know once you know your once your children got older did you kind of feel that way about it or did, was it kind of a you know you just kind of knew the time was right when i left yeah um some unexpected things happened in my life i hadn't originally been planning on leaving um it was just unexpected i guess is the best way to put it okay um and how did you enjoy your time in louisiana that was what a three three almost three years Still? No, it was about two and a half years. Two and a half? Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, my oldest grandson was born when we were there. That is true. I just saw him the other day. Isn't he something? He um, is. I was just commenting on how big he's gotten since he was here. And I think it's relative to how you, how big my son is getting and now thinking about what he was like when he first got here and I first met him. Uh, it was amazing. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I enjoyed my time in Baton Rouge. I met and made some very good friends there. Um, Baton Rouge was a lot in a sense like, it, it very much has people who have lived there for generations. It, um, I had a nice job there. And like I said, nice friends. I lived in a cute little apartment. It was really the first time that I lived on my own because after I got done college, I got married young. And that was probably, the, it was the first time that I ever, not, well, I had a short-term lease, that doesn't count. That was the first time that I really lived on my own. So even those things that people might think that they're doing when they're young, mm -hmm. um, sometimes you do them when you're at a different point in life. For example, yeah. when I got done college, my intention was that I was going to move and work in Washington, DC. I didn't, I had made other choices, which all were very good. And now here I am at the other end, years later, a grandmother my daughters are both grown now i'm working in washington dc so well, it all worked out in a way uh in some in some way it did yes i think it's important to always know that you can land on your feet and that things that happen in life were not always planned or expected but we have to deal with them mm -hmm. and there's just no there's just nothing else you can do. You simply have to deal with them. So you... I agree. I, I do agree. Um, I'm a pr very big proponent of things happening for a reason, but it's mm -hmm. not always apparent uh, why those things happen. And we all go through some type of turmoil in our life. And in the moment, we don't feel like we know why. It feels reasonless. And sometimes we feel hopeless because of the fact that we can't identify why it is. And I can identify things in my my own life where I've spent years trying to figure out why and then it clicked like five or six years later and there's a catharsis that comes along with finally figuring out you know why things happen um and through that journey I learned not to have regrets because it is what it is like but I also watch younger people today not to single out younger people and I don't know if you feel this way like my parents uh, always taught me that same principle things happen you, you are going to be faced with adversity, no matter how much planning you do, no matter how much preparation you have, um, and it's gonna happen. And you just sort of have to go with the flow and, and work through that. 
um, I, I notice a lot of younger people today not being able to do that as much as I was taught to do that. Um, do you think that philosophy has sort of changed over the years? And do you have a sense as to why we've sort of gone away from that path? It's not a general, you know, not every young person is like that, but um, I've definitely seen it in my workplace for sure. That's an interesting question. Um, I suppose that some of it may have to do with as we were growing up, what were we prepared for? I don't know. I don't know that I necessarily have the answer for that. Okay. That one these, is... are the, these are the philosophical things that go through my mind at the most random times. But um, I'm always fascinated by watching people's behaviors, seeing how we are trending. Um, you know, I look at the social media, the advent of social media, for instance, and I see so much of what is percolating, it seems like under the surface of society. And I don't like a lot of it. And, you know, I'd like to identify it in my, in my own life, but um, so we can't solve the, the ills of the world today. That's okay. Um, but um, so I, I'm pretty sure one of the things that you are most popular for, and this is how I learned about you, <laughs> is that you discovered um, photography. Um, and, and I don't want to say recently, but I found out about your your discovery of it at least on um, social media platforms very recently and i learned that you had sort of a cult following so um you want to let us know like what how did you get into that because i'm not very good at taking pictures well, i always enjoyed taking pictures uh particularly of my children as they were growing up and they'll tell you i have 14 scrapbooks downstairs each one full of Inc incredible pictures of them as they were growing up, things that we did, places that we went. And honestly, I think that a lot of it came with um, when I got my first iPhone and I realized, oh, I don't have to wait for the pictures to be developed to enjoy them. And then my daughters introduced me to Instagram and I'm just like, oh, this is the best because I look at it as a picture sharing content, social media. I don't get into the politics of it. I know many people do. Mm -hmm. I just like taking pictures and posting them. It's to me, that's fun. I tend to follow accounts. I just started this one. It's called Mudlarks in London. And it's people that go to the Thames River. You have to be licensed and pick out things that are washed up on shore. Okay. So there may be old coins. There may be pieces of pottery. And we're not talking United States old, you know, 1802. No. We're talking 16 something. I love following um, the old historic houses in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's interesting because when I lived in Baton Rouge, I started following some people down there. And now up here in Northern Virginia, I, I've started following people here and I've gotten ideas of places to go. And then when you see that they've been the same place you have, and I wonder at times, oh, were we there at the same time? Because I took a picture that day as well. So I, I just enjoy it for the simplicity and the innocence of it that I keep. I agree. I'm, I'm an Instagrammer and people who follow me know that I post the dumbest stuff, but it's stuff that I'm interested in. It's a picture sharing thing, like, so who cares? Um, but you, you do, you made me just think of something right now. And I think the reason why I like it so much is because a picture really is worth a thousand words and the interpretation of those pictures of those photographs images uh is different for everybody so when you post a photo 100 people could see it and all 100 of us could have a different interpretation it could make us feel differently i think these days on places like facebook and twitter uh, people are so focused on their words and you know they're trying to to get to um you know the an end via their words but sometimes just posting a photo with no words you allow the you allow your audience to sort of uh you know take with it what they want and i like that a lot i mean you know, your your pictures a lot of times come with quotes but i mostly don't read them because i just look at them and i look at what's in it and i say well you know what was she seeing what do i see what does somebody else see and i i, I like that aspect of instagram because i too follow mostly uh, accounts that just they're, they don't come with a political agenda. They don't come with some type of a, um, a bias toward their photos. They just present it to you and you get to, to, to interpret it how you'd like. I do enjoy finding a quote or song lyrics that I 
enjoy posting with the photo. And I, you know, people like you, you're looking at the photo, you may not necessarily see what I've mm -hmm. put in as a quote. Um, I like to think for me, that's an important part of it. Mm -hmm. I might have a song lyric going through my brain. I might have listened to something on the radio and just randomly come up with things. Um, one picture that I took of my oldest grandson, we were in the um, woods behind where I live and it was a fork in the road, a fork in the path. And literally the quote was, when you see a fork in the road, take it. And I just thought of that the moment I saw him standing there. So sometimes the picture brings the quote. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have a quote and I look for a picture. Okay. And a lot of times I think I know what picture I want to take and I wind up using something else, a different photo, maybe one that I just sort of took on took randomly. So well, it's, you it's have fun. You have mastered the iPhone picture taking process <laughs> because most of your pictures look very professional. Um, and like I said, I've just been kind of learning how to do that recently for other ventures that I do, but um, I found it fascinating. But one of the things you mentioned in there um, was, you know, London. And for the audience's um, you know, edification, if you will, one of the best interactions I think we've ever had was um, the, the royal wedding, the last one, which was what, 2018? Yes, it's when you and your gracious wife had me my oldest daughter her husband my oldest grandson and then my younger daughter and her boyfriend had come down to visit mm -hmm. um but we were staying with you so don't forget the dog <laughs> oh that's right that's right yes the dog we, we love jackson though jackson's fantastic um, he, he is that yeah and i i've made mention to that in one of the first episodes i ever published and um you know i knew my targeted audience for that and so it was but it was a, it was such a pure day and i just remember it very vividly because uh it was the first time we had bought that house about a year prior and it was the first time we had had what felt like a family sort of gathering in the house uh guests of significance and it was the first time we felt some ownership to the house in a way because part of your home is welcoming people into your home and being select i mean you you're selective about the people you you invite into your home and for me because i obviously knew your daughter uh mm -hmm. it was a no-brainer that that they were welcome in our home but um you know you you had never met us at least at least not significantly and so i'm sure it was it was weird at first, but um, it, it went so well. And it proved to us that our house was uh, big enough to, to have other people in it and not feel on top of each other. And I felt like that that uh, brunch that we when we watched the wedding, I, I remember cooking. I think I might have cooked some breakfast and it was just so much fun. Um, but I do not really care all that much about the royal family. And I, I'm sort of... Um, apathetic to it like I don't really have a feeling either way but I found out that many people do love it and um you and my wife and and your daughter were very big into it and so is it something that you've always followed um or is it just something that we got caught up in that particular day well I have a degree in history and politics so I've always been interested in um particularly western European history the interaction of how Queen Victoria is the grandmother and King Christian the whatever was the grandfather and how all those families work together. The royal family itself to me is a bit like Disney on steroids as far as the pomp and circumstance, the weddings, the glitz and the glitter. And I do enjoy watching it. Um, I remember watching back in 1981 when Diana and Charles got married. It was we got up real early and we watched it. And one thing to keep in mind about back then when we saw Sarah Ferguson and Prince Andrew get married is this was a rare occasion. We did not have social media. It wasn't an instant news feed. So it was, it was special because you did not see these individuals any other time besides something big like that. It, People Magazine, I believe, started in the late 70s, early 80s. So to an extent, you just didn't have exposure to this kind of life that other people had, royalty and all that. So 
and it's all it's fun to watch big big weddings to see the beautiful dresses to see how everybody looks um and it's interesting because i was in london once with my younger daughter and then um with my whole family we were in scotland a couple years ago about a year and a half ago is you don't see magazines that have any royal people on the covers it seems to be more of an american thing but i love it i had fun it's more of an event i suppose you could say that's true and you you mentioned a concept that i i talk about these days because i'm i'm somewhat of an old soul sometimes and i mentioned how we don't really have appointment television anymore um it's true yes you know the concept of appointment television when i say that to somebody who's in their 20s uh at work they're like i don't know what that means and i'm like because you haven't actually had something to look forward to that is an appointment that you make in your book I need to be watching the television at this time on this date because that's the only time I'm going to catch it. Uh, nowadays, you don't have to watch it live. It'll be streamed on YouTube. You can go watch it on demand. Um, and I, that that's a good way to look at it. And I think that that concept must have been passed down in some way because my parents never watched that stuff. So that, that kind of thing. So I obviously never picked up an interest in it. Uh, but you through your, your life education and just you know the concept of it being a unique event and an event that you could sort of live vicariously through because it probably thinking about it now felt like a fairy tale in some fat in some way because they live this this pomp and circumstance existence and the 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 fashion is out, out of this world with the fascinators and the just you know we don't see that a lot in this country we don't really have an equivalent i don't feel um and if we do it's probably not something on that level but I just remember thinking, well, we put a lot of stock into our former oppressors, don't we? And I think that's like the joke that's running around about that. But we've come to learn a little bit more about the royal family and for recent events. Um, you know, ha has that changed anything for you as far as the, um, you know, not the, the glitz and glamour of the royal family? Has it taken some of the polish off? No, because I think in life there are three sides to every story. You have person A, person B, and somewhere in between lies the truth. Um, no, these are people who really live, are really private people. And I think it's important to keep that in perspective. Um, the things that may make the news these days as far as perceived grievances, um, things that may have been said, whether true or not, I think it gets a lot more attention because of the ever going on news media, the news feed. I mean, getting back to what we saw in the 80s when Diana and Sarah Ferguson got married, you saw those weddings and that was it. You never saw anything again. You might hear on the news, oh, this person's pregnant, but you didn't have an everyday interaction with it. So in a way, it almost feels, these, it feels as though the last, oh, I don't know, 30, 30 some years, almost at times invasive in people's lives but i still watch it i still follow it so can't be all I, that <laughs> no i i was just curious because i know in like this instance i felt the same way i i felt as if it was there there was nuance to the the, the concept of what was going on because there's a lot of narrative today that mm -hmm. it's either one way or the other it's it's a lot of that and it felt like if you didn't fully agree with what Meghan and Harry were saying, that right. somehow you were all of these other things. But as as you alluded to, there is always three sides and you always have to take all of that into perspective. Uh, I just thought it was an interesting look into, you know, if, even if half of what you know, Meghan was saying came true, uh, it speaks to there's other issues that go on outside of this country that we sometimes feel like are singular to this country, like racial relations in general, I think feels very yeah. compartmentalized to the United States, but it happens in, in a lot worse ways in other places too. And it kind of shed a little bit of light on that for me and some other people in my life, it sort of reminded them of it. But uh, I'm kind of with you that, you know, the, the, the mystery of the royal family is kind of what makes it so uh, intriguing. And having all that insight into everything, like I felt like the last four years, they were, a, you know, they were what they were, but the constant news cycle made it yeah. a thousand times worse. And by extension, I think it makes a lot of things exacerbated. I know that I have to take a break from the news cycle uh, a lot. 
because it's just constant with everything and it's not even bad things it's just good things like everything is all over the place we overanalyze everything it takes away from the fun a little bit for me and again with the instant news cycle i have um new york times and washington post subscriptions digital subscriptions and um so i'll get push notices on my phone or i'll constantly be checking the news to see what's going on what are people's comments you know what is what is going on now with the prior administration it was always a sense of anxiety and strife um whereas now it's a little bit more even in my mind but again i'm reading the new york times and the washington post which i will say is uh, even with my political background, I find the Washington Post to be just a little bit too liberal, even for me. But, um, but I mean, the fact that the news is always available um, kind of means it never goes away. But just getting back real quick about the news and the royal family, I believe Meghan Markle said that she didn't know who Prince Harry was. And everybody that I know, yes, exactly, was kind of like, wait a minute, you're born knowing who this, person was is now granted she was born before him but you know who these people are you see them on people magazine so when i heard that comment made i just was like um i don't know how much credence i give to everything else she's saying because i simply cannot believe that somebody doesn't know who these people are i would agree and i think in today's world too, when you're on the level that they are, like they're both celebrities in some way and, it, and for different reasons, I would like to think that most people are aware of other people at that level. Like, I mean, it, it does, it did seem implausible to me that she didn't know who he was when, I mean, people had his brother on like, you know, they, they idolize, he was like a teen idol. And yeah. um, it just, it does seem a little bit unbelievable. And I agree with you. Like the other thing that about that situation that I questioned, and I'm not questioning, you know, like how she was treated necessarily, but, um, you know, the I didn't know that that w that's what I was getting into part of it. Yeah, I hear oh. that. You know, I hear that from parents too. I didn't realize it was going to be this hard, and I always say, "Well, what did you think it was going to be? Like, <laughs> you're it, you're you're raising another human being. Um, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, and you're marrying into the royal family, like." I don't. I guess I don't understand the the misconceptions about what that was going to be like. It's always been that way. They've always presented themselves in a very specific way that, um, you know, protects the legacy of of the yeah. royal family. And there, I, there is part of me that wonders if she kind of felt like she didn't have to play by those rules. And then the backlash that she received from it from the the people that are involved you know, it rubbed her the wrong way. So I do think it was a mixture of both. But th those two things that you, you pointed to made me say, huh, so maybe there's a little bit less to this than, you know, Oprah's making it out to be. And I, I don't know how you feel about Oprah, but whenever she gets involved in something, I'm thinking, oh, great. Um, because I feel like it's, it's over dramatized if that's that's not even the word you know what I'm, you know what i'm trying to allude yes to. because um no i'm not an oprah person however she represents entertainment yeah and that's what that interview was for it was for entertainment mm -hmm. it's not i don't look to somebody in a position like oprah winfrey has for news correct so to me that was a huge difference was it was entertainment uh, yeah I make that distinction a lot uh, with with my wife about the Today Show, and I'm like, this isn't journalism. This is entertainment. Yeah. Uh, Oprah is not a journalist in my mind. She's entertaining. Like, if I want the real scoop, I want somebody who is an actual journalist who's going to get to the bottom of what actually happened, who's going to take the time to get the facts straight. You're right. The presentation of it was very one-sided. Um, it didn't. It, I didn't feel as if it told the whole picture and it was intentionally made to make the royal family seem like, um, you know, racist and all of these other things that it's probably not quite as true as that presentation made it out to be. Yeah, yeah. And I guess one last thing I'd say about her, Meghan Markle claiming she didn't know who Prince Harry was, is that um, in today's day, I know that before I took my jobs where I'm at, I did deep Google searches. Um, and I think that most people, when they go on a blind date, would get that, would, I don't want to use the right or wrong. I do believe 
it's important to know who you're going out with. And we call it in the legal field, we quote, stalk our clients to the extent that we're not stalking them per se. However, if somebody's claiming an injury for something and we find them on Facebook mm -hmm. doing what they said they can't do, um, anyhow, long story short is I don't believe that a person would necessarily go on a blind date without being absolutely sure that this person was not a good person. I agree. And it's not even that the person that she married is is not a good person like that. I don't think, you know, like their, their relationship to me wasn't in question, but there's there's things that come with it. And I'm with you. Like when I was doing the online dating scene, uh, I Googled everybody and the stuff that I found legendary, absolutely legendary. And you just want to know. And it's it's funny because me, I as a male, you know, would do that. And I would hope that that other people were doing it as well. And they would never, you know, there was nothing that they could find on me outside of the most mundane stuff, like when I graduated high school and that I, you know, where I worked, but um, it's just, you're right. In today's age, you, you want to have that at your fingertips. And I would like to think that she or somebody on her, you know, team would have said, hey, <laughs> this is this is kind of what this is all about. Here's what we found on it. It's not as if there's not uh, evidence as to what that, that lifestyle is like that she couldn't have pulled from. Interesting commentary. I was wondering how you'd go on that because I know, um, you know, you 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 are somebody who, um, you know, always wants to to do the right thing and and give people the benefit of the doubt. But you know, we were presented with a very one sided argument there, and a lot of people's views on it were skewed, in my mind, yes. from that. Um, yes. To go back to the news cycle, um, you know, you talked about how when you were younger and and growing up, like things were events. You were not overexposed to a lot of you know events that were taking place if it was on the news it was on there for a reason but you weren't uh, exposed to the everyday um doings of it do you think today it makes it more difficult for parents especially parents that ha are, have children who are more aware of what's going on like my brother-in-law has 12 year old nieces and they're starting to ask a lot of difficult questions and they shield them from the news cycle uh, mm -hmm. on purpose do you feel like it's it's a more difficult nowadays like obviously um you know you you can't protect them from everything but it's like you have to protect them from so much now because there's just so many avenues where they could find out anything that they want that's that's a good question the news these days is not going back to the old time as i remember my parents watching i'm not that old huntley brinkley and walter cronkite who gave the news in a very news fashion it was there was nowadays you watch if i watch cnn i know i'm getting the cnn version which is going to be different than somebody else's version we got mm -hmm. facts i'm not saying that we don't get facts now um i think as parents we know that our children are always going to be exposed to um things that we may not necessarily want them exposed to they may be watching tv at somebody else's house and we just can't control that um, I think it's important that they know that they should ask, even if it's an uncomfortable subject, no matter what age they are, there's always a discussion that can be had. Uh, I think to tell a child, well, wait until you get older, may not always be the right response. It may need a more simplified response at say my oldest grandson's age. However, he still, I wouldn't want to be telling a child I'll wait till you're older. I would give them a simple response, but I think that there's just so much news and it seems to be very biased no matter what, that yes, it's very hard to decide how to, to try and figure out how to talk to your children about it. Yeah, I, I know that um, it's something that I think about. So I think everybody in the audience at this point knows that um, I now have a, he's almost 14 months now. Um, and sadly, because of COVID-19, you haven't met him yet. So uh, that needs to happen and it will happen, I'm hopeful. But um, you and I have talked offline about parenting because I did an episode about the things they don't tell you about parenting because I learned mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of I don't want to say hard truths, but I knew it was going to be difficult. But even so, there's nothing that can really prepare you for it. And they certainly don't have resources that are extensive enough to, to get the job done. But in today's day and age, you're shamed for doing something or not doing something as a parent. And 
you had contacted me offline because you were so happy to hear me stand up for uh, moms out there who go through a lot. They're asked to do a lot. And I understood my role as a, as a father that, you know, there's not much that I can do at the beginning, but do whatever I can to support what she's going through. Um, and I, it's so hard today because you're, you're constantly told what not to do, what to do. And I don't know, sometimes I feel as if I'm not allowed to make a decision on my own merit as a parent. Um, did you ever go through that? Um, I would say that the mommy wars have been going on forever and ever. And it's interesting because I've never seen anything that one could say was the daddy wars as far as parenting. I know that when my daughters were growing up, um, I was home with them for a little bit. And then I went back to work part time for for while they were in school and that it was I more than once I was told, oh, you work um, because yeah. And it was like, yes, I do. And I didn't feel the need to justify it. I was, it worked well for our family. So everybody seems to know better how to raise your child. I find all parenting books, I don't want to say they're lying, they're not, but aside of certain things, you really have to experience it to know, to know what it's all about, which is why I, and I hope I've been successful, I think I have, is not telling my um, grandson's parents, oh, you should do this or you should do that. Rather, if I'm asked my opinion, I will offer it, but things, parents change and ways of doing things change. And I think that people need to be, parents need to be respected. One of the things you and I had discussed was how feeding babies, whether a mother wants to nurse or bottle feed, um, and I just think that people need to keep their their noses out of what another family chooses to do, particularly with that. Um, it's nobody else's business. And the important thing is that a baby gets fed. And it's each person's, like I said, each person's situation is different. And I just find it to be almost shaming mm -hmm. to an extent. Now we were encouraged to nurse. Uh, I'm worked out very well for me but i know it doesn't work out well for everybody but nowadays it just seems as though from what i've seen mothers who choose not to or mothers who decide that they're going to do it for a week a month a year a week or a month are shamed by their decision not to and i don't think anybody has the right to do that to tell I'm another you. mother yeah I'm, I'm with you um i i learned very early like you know i i spent a lot of uh, my wife's pregnancy trying to figure out what my role was going to be and knowing where i could i don't want to say like add the most value because i knew that the first year was just a lot of it felt like a job uh yeah. you you there's a lot of things you just have to do and i struggled mightily with not get not feeling the the joy that everybody said that i was going to feel that first you know for the first like three or four months it felt like a job chris and i were just not on the you know we were on the same page but not on the same page she was struggling with a lot but i did learn early that i needed to just figure out ways that i could support her whether that was something that she needed whether it was when she didn't need me or most importantly when she didn't know what the heck she needed at all and um but i remember sitting in those nursing uh you know the first cons consultation with the lactation folks and they're like we'll just keep keep go keep at it keep at it keep at it and i'm like you're not listening to what she's telling me She's exhausted. The baby's not gaining weight. Nothing's working here. Like, what are the other options? And they're like, well, just keep at it. And I'm like, that, that is such BS. Um, and I just remember, she's like, I'm so struggling with this. And I said, you need to do whatever's best for the baby mm -hmm. and for you too. Mm -hmm. And you know what? She ended up, she didn't nurse, but she she pumped and he gained weight like a crazy kid. And all was well, but she struggled again. Sure. When she was She was running out. You know, her supply was dwindling. And I said, look, you gave him eight months of that. He's perfectly healthy. Yeah. All that a win. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what, you know, your friends are doing, what somebody on social media is doing. Like, they can do them. We're going to do us. Uh, and I figured out early that my best, my, my biggest role was just to support her. Like, I, when, when James was being born, um, I didn't say a whole lot. I knew when to say something. I knew when she needed that push but for lack of a better word <laughs> um but i 
I, I don't know. I really struggled with the, the satisfaction that I wasn't getting. And I thought, is there something wrong with me? Am I not mm -hmm. hardwired to be a parent? And I've come to find out that so many parents don't talk enough about how real it is, especially at the beginning. A lot of people either forget it or they um, misremember what it's like. The newborn phase was oof, oof. Uh, but now it's it's something that's in the past. But I wanted to know what, you know, even back then, before social media, there was still all of that. And what was the thing you struggled with most? It Was it the work thing, people shaming you for working? Or was there something else about being a mom that you you felt like should be go feel, feel differently but didn't quite come to fruition the way that you thought it would or was told that it would well i mean it i don't mean to say that i was shamed i did i didn't feel shamed per se about being a working mom i guess it was just kind of a well yes it was to an extent people passing their own opinion on as to what i should be doing um as First of all, you completely forget all those sleepless nights. I just want to let you know that right now. Um, and I think that each each child is unique, each baby is unique. Um, so there's not necessarily the way, I mean, if, if another child were to come into your life or anybody who has one and has another or another, they're not going to be the same. They're going to be radically different. Um, so I think that when you look at the social media aspect of it, it's important for people to remember, all parents, everybody, is that people only share their joys on social media. They don't share their sorrows. So when you see pictures of these babies and kids just so beautiful and these wonderful birthday parties, they're not showing you the sorrows, not necessarily sorrows, but you know, they're not showing you the times that aren't happy. And it mm -hmm. gives a sense that everything must be a happy, happy time. And I know obviously back when my daughters were born in the 80s and then growing up in the 90s, we didn't really have anything like that to compare to. So I think it was easier and it was probably less feeling of less feeling of self shame than perhaps some parents, some moms particularly might feel now when they look on social media and they see their friends or acquaintances, people they went to high school or college with, it's like, oh my gosh, look, that person's living the dream life. But we didn't have that. So I don't know that I could say I felt, I felt any kind of quote shame. And um, I don't think anybody should feel it. We just need to have a lot more respect for each other's choices. Has it been difficult watching your own child go through, you know, motherhood and knowing that you went through something, but that it's not necessarily applicable for her and not being able to sort of alleviate it? Because as you said, and it's so true that every baby's different. I can honestly say unequivocally that watching my daughter be a mom is simply the greatest joy that there is. Um, and I, would say that she knows her way, that she's doing it, her and her husband, and they're just doing a fantastically wonderful job of it. And that my my role is to support them as much as I can. And if, like I said, not, if the, there isn't anything that I would pass comment on, but if I ever would feel the need to, I wouldn't, because it wouldn't, I think no matter what the circumstance, nobody wants to be told you're doing something, you need to do it a different way. Yeah. Is there something that exists today that didn't exist back then that you think to yourself, oh, that would have made things so much easier? Because I listened to my in-laws talk about, they did, we didn't have wipes, we used cotton balls and we thought, ooh, no thanks. Um, so I don't know if there, and it could have been, you know, they couldn't afford it, they were a military family, so I don't know if that's what it was, but. Um, is there some like invention that's come out when you think, man, that would have made things a lot easier? You know, I don't necessarily think so. When my oldest daughter was born, we didn't have um, baby monitors and that was fine. You know, everything, every 
there was no problem. When my younger daughter was born, we had these old walkie talkie kind of ones. Mm -hmm. So I would say that to me, the elements of raising children haven't changed. That not having something such as a baby monitor that didn't really didn't make a difference. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously there's a lot more safety things now. The, I think back on the car seats that we had back then and it's just like, oh my gosh, that was horrible. Um, but we know so much more now that, so I suppose that the one thing I could say is that to the extent that things are safer, such as car seats, high chairs, equipment that's available, it would have been nice to have them back then. Um, and other than that, babies need people to love them, their parents, extended people. I love your little one. I didn't even met him. So. <laughs> well, you will. Um, he has a lot of love to give. Uh, but one thing that clicked for me was the first moment where he did something and I said, that's me. And I realized, <laughs> but it, 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 the reason I say it clicked was because all the months of sleepless nights and just not knowing what to do, feeling so like rudderless. And I realized that part of myself had been passed down like that he was my child and that it, that set me on a different path now where yeah, I don't the, the all the other stuff that comes along with it doesn't feel as much like a job anymore I feel as if that satisfaction came and it was realizing that well this is my he is mine and now I also know that I want him to grow up to be him and mm -hmm. not like okay you, you know he he crosses his ankles the way that I do it's the cutest thing ever, yeah. So he sits and reads a book with me, and that's the first thing he does. He crosses his ankles, and we just we we die because that's what it is. Uh, what was the? Did you ever have a moment like that where, you know, I you know, you were like, oh wow, that's 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 me. Oh wow. Um, well, I would say that from the first time I looked at them, they looked exactly like my side of the family. Um, I would say that both of them just have a lot of passion for doing things that bring good and things that they enjoy doing. Um, they're both very devoted to families, but no, I can't think of anything like that, you know, as you have. And I think a lot of that has to do with time that has passed. But what that is also, though, is a very good example that your children see and hear everything. So... James sees you doing that, and he's going to see everything else that you do. Um, he's going to hear things. All children are going to hear things that their parents think that they don't hear. And it's mm -hmm. funny because my mom's side of the family is Jewish, and I remember growing up, and the relatives, if they didn't want us to know what they were saying, they would speak in Yiddish. So unless we can speak, and I know with my oldest grandson, we do this at times, we'll spell, you know, we'll just quickly spell the word if we don't want him here, but he's going to eventually, he'll learn how to spell, so won't be able to do that anymore. So, but as far as something that I remember looking at them and saying that they're mine, well, honestly, they came out of me, so they were mine from the very beginning. Well, even though it was more because it's it's a lot, like even though mm -hmm. you, maybe it's different for mothers, but like for me, um, just you know navigating through how much there was to do and how little we felt like sure of it uh it was it was that that kind of got me out of the the fog of well you know what i actually am getting that satisfaction i just haven't i just haven't realized it because this has just been a crazy and, and, and honestly he was born right at the start of the pandemic too uh, our in-laws were living with us there's a lot going on in the freight's household let me tell you um so it was like wow um but I want to ask you, we got seven minutes left about, and I want to give you some time to answer this question. Um, I asked this of a lot of people, and I, I got asked it in an interview once, and I think it's a great question. Um, if there was a biography written about you, um, what what would you what would you want your legacy to be? Oh my gosh! Wow. Well, I would hope it would be that I was a good parent, that it was a good friend, that I had good intentions with everything that I did, that I made the best of situations, whether expected or unexpected, that I put passion into what I did. Um, I really, even it, 
with grown adult children, I'm still a parent. And I don't like when people say, oh, if I had known grandchildren were this much fun, I would have had them first because no, I love being a mom, even with adult children. So a mother from the time they're born until what, until forever in my mind. So, you know, it's, it's, Family to me is what's primary. And I would like for people to think that, and it's not just family that you're necessarily related to by blood or by marriage. Um, so I just would like, and, and I mean, even as far as my work goes, I do enjoy what I do and I hope I advance the cause of helping people who may be in difficult situations. So, um, and that I was passionate about things. I mean, I even made it down to cherry blossoms this year, real, just for real quick. Yeah, just for real quick. So, um, and I'm very, I mean, I have, I love history. So that's one of the things I love about this region is just so much of it. And I seek it out. In fact, I went somewhere, I went to Bull Run on Sunday and I came across the cemetery and I was like, oh, wow, I love cemeteries. So I actually do too. Um, and people think it's creepy, but there's a lot of history in there, especially up in New England where they're old cemeteries and um but you know that sounds like a really good legacy i'll be honest um passion something that i'm big into um you know family and my family definition is very similar to yours but i can tell you having seen you and known you now for a few years um you cultivate a family you know it's outside the confines of just who's related to you or just who's blood you know when i when i joked about you had a cult following with photography um <laughs> You know, there are a lot of people that I know who who see you the same way that I see you. And your support to me and on this show has been motherly and it has gone not unnoticed. And to me, that's a, to me, that's a familial thing. Um, you know, your daughter is is basically like my sister. I tell her that all the time. And I don't feel as if family is bound to just who you're related to, because mine is not, you know, they're not people that necessarily align with me. So I don't have a lot of blood relatives that I have strong bonds with. So I make bonds elsewhere. And uh, it sounds like, you know, sounds like what you want for your legacy is what I see of you. And that's why I thought you should be on here to tell the people, however few there are, um, what you're all about, because I think the world needs more people like you in it. And we don't, we don't have enough of those people highlighted. We always talk about the bad people. A lot of good people out there. Everybody's listening. If you're surrounded by bad people, Go seek out the good people because they're right next door or across the street. You just got to find them. They're everywhere. So I wanted you to be on here because you. you're you're a good person and you cultivate <laughs> that idea of family for so many people. And I think uh, some people who are like that, the everyday heroes, they don't get the recognition that they deserve. Uh, probably you, you do, hopefully, from, from your children. But um, there's probably many people whose lives you've touched in some way who have never told you that. So I'm here to tell you them, tell you that from all of them. Well, th well, thank you. I can truly say that I do feel, I do feel a lot of love in my life from all, all corners. And, um, it's, it's a very nice feeling to know that I'm making people happy and that they're making me happy. And at the end of the day, that's really what you a person is remembered for is how they made others feel. Agreed. I don't know how I make others feel. I just hope that I do the best that I can to make at least one person every day feel something special. So um, that's what that's that's what I try and do every day. I have no idea what my legacy will be. Um, to me, it's still unwritten. So making it happen. Well. I can say that sometimes some we're going along this path and here we go. And no matter where you are in life, whether it's as a child, I mean, or a teenager in college or whatever, left turns happen, right turns happen. So you make them all into right turns and um, work your way, you work your way to the, to the good in life. I mean, it just, it has a way, things have a way of falling into place. I agree. That's a great way to end this, by the way. Um, Miss Joyce, I appreciate 
you taking the time uh you've been amazing as i thought you would be and um i know that whoever listens to this will will definitely uh, pick up on that and um i'm hoping to have you back in the future if you're if you're game so um thank you so much for joining so fully casual uh episode 50 um you know this will hopefully start something new i'm looking to have more voices on here so you are the first to sort of enlighten the world as to your awesomeness so uh, appreciate it um for everybody else you know thanks for tuning in uh definitely check me out on instagram soulfully casual podcast uh you know send me a message i want to hear whether you like it whether you don't like it uh interaction uh is is what i'm looking for in connection so uh miss joyce i appreciate your time uh and have a great rest of your week thank you and lots of hugs and kisses to the family everyone you the wonderful missus and that little little well he's not so little anymore but james I will. You know it. He gets kisses all the time. So uh, we will be seeing you down the road, Miss Joyce. Thank you. Absolutely. Take care.